92% of households that start the year with Peloton are still active a year later. 92% because of a bike? Not just bikes. We also make treadmills and rowers. Oh, let me guess, for elite athletes only, right? Nope. It doesn't matter if you're an avid exerciser or new to working out. Peloton can help you achieve your fitness goals. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton bikes, tread or row, risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for a bonus episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Digital Federal Credit Union, better known by all of us by now as simply DCU. And If you're trying to get some new wheels, DCU can help you. Whether you're driving off the lot or you want to refinance, DCU can help you save on your next auto loan with rates as low as 1.49% APR. You heard me. Whether you're getting a new car or you want to refinance, DCU can help you with rates as low as 1.49% APR. And you can learn more and get all of the details at dcu.org slash auto. Insured by the NCUA, membership required. Well, today is my birthday, October 1st. And I got wind that someone wanted to call in and wish me a happy birthday. And that person is Dean DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots. I couldn't believe it. I was like, of course I want to talk to Dean DeLeo on my birthday. Now, Dean DeLeo has already been a guest on the Mistress Carrie podcast. He was on episode 58, if you missed it, and it's linked in the show notes of this bonus episode. Dean's been very busy since we talked. He finished up a new project that he was telling me about in episode 58, but he didn't tell me what it was called, and it's called Trip the Witch. You can hear the new music from that and all of the other artists that we talk about and all the music we talk about in the corresponding playlist for this bonus episode that's in the show notes. We also talked about Stone Temple Pilots going on tour, which he couldn't tell me about on episode 58 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. STP is getting ready to hit the road and they have a stop in Worcester, Massachusetts on November 5th at the Palladium. Tickets are available now. We talked about that. We talked about Kevin Martin from Candlebox. We talked about his guitar lessons as a kid. We talked about his impression of Tom Petty and talked more about marching bands because, well, it's turning into a thing that Dean DeLeo and I do. We also referenced his hysterical laugh. And we talked about some early childhood memories of Halloween with his brother Robert. Having Dean DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots on the show is always awesome. And the fact that he wanted to call and wish me a happy birthday, well, that was just awesome. So here he is again. Allow me to reintroduce you to Dean DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots. Oh, a little Libra. My wife's a Libra. Yeah, you got to look out because we're trouble. (laughs) Well, happy birthday. Thank you. The last, yeah. the last time I had you on the show, there are three things that happened on the show that people are still talking about. 
Number one, it? people are very concerned that your 16-year-old has custody of your acoustic guitar that you wrote all your songs on, and they want to make sure he's being careful. Rocco's 18 now, and uh, he's acquired a few more guitars. So he, he still does have uh, the acoustic, the Yamaha FG160, and he takes great care of it, but he also... He also plays it and writes on it. He's doing a lot of writing and he has a beautiful Les Paul gold top. And um, the last thing he got, it was a nice uh, Fender, um, uh, a nice Fender Deluxe, like a 73 Fender Deluxe. So yeah, Telly. So yeah, he's, um, he's careful and he, he's becoming quite, um, quite the musician, great drummer, plays bass, guitar, piano. It runs in the family then. I don't know. It must be the water. It's got to be something because no one in my family is musically inclined and I'm not. I got screwed in the gene pool. My daughter, too, who's nine, is just a complete artist, too, in every sense of the word. She's just recently started taking her dolls that are all adorned for the uh, for attending the ball with their hair and their big gowns. And she's like, Dad, can I? Can I do it? I'm like, of course, do what you want to them. So she cuts their gowns into mini skirts, gives them these really amazing haircuts and does their makeup with paint. And they're incredible. And she's done that to all her dolls. And she, she's really tapping into this whole kind of, and she loves to paint and she loves to sing. So I'm hoping to get her in the studio soon and cut, cut a couple little things with her. She's nine. Please tell me that there has been a time where Dean DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots has sat down and been a makeup model for his nine-year-old daughter. Please tell me you have. I have. Okay. I have my hair. My hair has done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing everybody talked about was your impression of Tom Petty. Really? Because you were talking about, we were talking about Play, me playing the clarinet and you did your Tom Pet, your Tom Petty impression about the joke you heard him about the frog yeah, yeah, yeah. and people were like Dean DeLeo sounded just like Tom Petty does he do any other impressions <laughs> I don't do any impressions but that was a great joke uh oh heck what was it that Tom said there's something about the 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 trombone, trombone player, player and a yeah. Frog. yeah, and that the frog yeah. was going to a gig. Yeah, the frog was going to a gig. <laughs> so funny. And the last thing everybody talked about was you singing the first song you ever played on guitar, because people were listening and texting into the studio like, "Are you kidding?" And you were like, "It was so uncool. I just wanted to play side one of Kiss Alive." And everybody was like, oh, I know it was Roger Miller's uh, King of the Road. Yes. That was one of the first songs I learned to play. And oh, gosh. Yeah. And you sang it to me and everybody was like, oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's face it. The great Roger Miller, like legendary. Right. But, you know, as as like. An 11, 12 year old kid, I, you know, I did not want to play folk music. No, Roger Miller is not play, cool. I wanted to play in my time of dying off graffiti, you know? And yes. Yeah. Uh, so, but you know, that's where I started. My, my mom, God bless her. Uh, I was getting lessons from one of her friend's sons who was a folk guy. So I was being taught folk songs. Yeah, you, Can you. Remember? King of the Road, Everybody's Talking at Me by Nilsson and, you know, John Denver and James yeah. Taylor. And- exactly. Now, um, I talked to a few people after I talked to you. Uh, I talked to Kevin Martin from Candlebox and I talked to a few other guys and I had reference because I've been asking everybody about guitar tones and how it comes from your fingers and the style of play that you have And I had told people, I just talked to Dean DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots, and he said that every single person I talked to that knows you, A, said what an amazing guy you are, and B, says you have the best laugh. And they told me that if I got you to laugh, that that is a good thing. And I was like, he does have the best laugh. (laughs) 
<laughs> so now I'm now I'm I'm uh, now you're self conscious. I'm not gonna laugh. Yeah, I know. You I know, okay. So Kevin, I called him not too long ago. Did you see that lover boy thing they did? Yeah. Was that amazing? He's one of those guys that I've known him for so long, and he's he's one of those guys. Maybe it's a rock thing, but I just love people that are just unapologetically themselves, that just are truthful and open and honest. And I've known him for so long and he's just one of those guys that I, I get on with him. And it's like, I talked to him yesterday, even if it's been a year since I've talked to him. And he was like, he was like, doesn't he have the best laugh? And I was like, yes, he does. (laughs) And I have an obnoxious cackle. People call it the carry cackle. And so if I'm out somewhere and I laugh, people turn around and they're like, that's got to be Carrie because nobody, it's the most obnoxious thing I've ever heard in my life. So you they don't need to be room. self-conscious. They, yeah. They'll know we're in the room, right? They'll know we're in the room. That's right. So, yeah, I saw that thing. Somebody sent me that. The, cat, the, the, uh, the, the uh, oh gosh, what was the name of the band now? They, they covered uh, Loverboy. Yes. They covered that Loverboy song. And you know, it's really interesting because look, we've heard that song a million times, right? And because it's great. Times. We've right, heard okay. it that many times because it's so good. Yeah. But then when someone else covers a song, then you realize, wow, that's that's actually a pretty well-crafted song. And those guys killed it. I had to call him and just tell him, like, man, that was so great, man. It was so good. I found it so entertaining. I'm such a huge fan of cover songs for two different reasons, that you're either going to pay homage to the original and try to do it justice in its own right, but I also love when an artist kind of makes it their own, whether they change the tempo or the melody a little bit, Um, and then it makes you, like you said, recognize how well-crafted it is because you can strip everything else away. You can change who's playing on it, the instruments it gets played on. And if it's still good, it's just good. I agree. I totally agree. However, I never really delved into, I've heard a couple things of when the lips redid the entire dark side of the moon record. Did you ever get into any of that? Yeah. Now talk about somebody making it their own. I mean, and and look, that's just saying I want to go climb a mountain. Might as well start with Everest. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's one of the most yeah. iconic rock albums in history. So why not just do that one? <clears throat> I know, and it's, it was a very ambitious undertaking, but they did it in their own special way, and man, I just really love that band. I love, I love. Uh, Stephen and everything he does, you know, Stephen's really uh, another one of those extraordinary musicians that just, you know, plays everything and anything and plays it all really well. And just uh, I love everything that cat does. When you and I talked, you were just talking about the reissue of Tiny Music. And then literally right after you and I talked, you guys announced all your tour dates. Okay. And I was like, yes, they're coming to town. So they're, you oh, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Them. Yeah, yeah. So you guys are going to be at the Palladium on November 5th. Then you guys announced a string of shows with Bush. And even though the tour wasn't going to come by me, I was psyched because I was like, oh, that tour is going to be great. Bush is the last band I saw before the pandemic at the very end of February. Okay. And then that leg of the tour got canceled because the guys from Bush pulled off the road for the rest of the year, which is happening a lot right now awful um yeah we were really thrilled i i should actually be on the road right now we were supposed to be out with bush it was a a five-week tour scheduled starting about a week and a half ago where we're gonna do five weeks then bush kind of cut it down to two weeks and then like a week before we were supposed to go do those two weeks they pulled out all together so we were just like ah shucks man so we're going to continue with uh, the back leg of the tour that was booked with uh, our dear friends, Tyler Bryant and the Shakedown. Great and, band. And that's the that's the tour that that I'm going to see you at on November 5th at the Palladium. I'll be there. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Unless you're at Fenway again and are like, do we really have to go play a rock show? Because I'd really no, just like to stay. That was the coolest night ever. Thank you so much for that. That was so fun. 
That was really, really cool. Well, November is with us that night, right? Cage, yeah. Cage, Cage the Elephant guys are with us. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's yeah. November's a little late for baseball this year. And don't ask me for Pat's tickets because they're hard to get right now. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Especially sure this weekend are. because Tom Brady's coming back to Gillette for the first time since he left the team. So you got to literally sell bone marrow to get those tickets. I got to tell you a really silly story. You know, we played Gillette Stadium. Oh, my goodness. Many, 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 many years ago. You'll, you'll probably remember the game. We went on before Rage Against the Machine. There was like 90,000 people in the stadium. It was Rage Against the Machine. The mighty, mighty boss tones were on the bill. Oh, yeah. And I remember going on. I remember going on right before um, Rage. And Dickie Barrett from the boss tones, I was backstage, and Dickie Barrett says, Oh, hey, Dean, man, come here. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Drew Bledsoe. <laughs> and I go, what was your name? Oh, my God. I was like, a lot going on. But, you know, I, I wasn't really aware. I wasn't really following football so much then. And here was the great Drew Bledsoe. And, a, and a, a, I think a day or two went by. And I think it was like, you know, maybe. And I, and I, saw, I saw Drew on TV, and I was like, Oh shoot! Yeah, it's the one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, the great Drew Bledsoe. That I just met. You know, you can't be good at everything, Dean. <laughs> there was a lot going on. <laughs> there was a lot going on. <laughs> Those venues. Talk to me about the difference between playing a giant football stadium like that, especially on a festival gig where there's just bands everywhere. And then playing in like an old theater like the Palladium, because it's got to be very different for you. You know, you would think, I, I, for me, there's a big misconception there. I think people would think it'd be a little more unnerving to be in front of a, a 90,000 seat stadium. For me, it's actually much more unnerving to be in a smaller venue. When people are closer, right on top of you, there's a lot less room for error. You know, when you're in front of 90,000 people, there's so much going on. You know, clunkers just go right by, you know, or, or there's a lot more room for error. The smaller the venue, you have to really, really be on your toes. And um, I, love, I love both. I love the energy of the magnitude of a huge stadium and I love um, being forced to really be on my toes and really to like deliver a great performance and just, um, you know, the energy of that small room too, where it's so reciprocal and um, you can really, really see people's faces right up, right up next to you. I love it. And there's something about those old theaters too, with all the ornate balconies, like, yeah. they don't build buildings like that anymore. And when you get into some of those old theaters, it's it's got a vibe to it. It surely does, especially, uh, you know, there's there's got to be some ghosts all, you know, around those hallways, right? Yeah, absolutely. I got, like, five seconds of what it must feel like for you to be on stage in a giant stadium because a few years back, I got to introduce Metallica on stage at Gillette Stadium. Oh and I, goodness. and I want like, look, I've been to Gillette. I can't tell you how many times between football games and concerts and whatever. But when you walk out on that stage in a, in a venue that big, and I was just, uh, you grab that mic. It's the closest thing I'm going to get. Cause as we've discussed, I have zero musical talent, but you grab that mic. You feel so powerful. Like <laughs> it's when that wave of like the wave of screaming and the noise from the audience, it's, it's like a tidal wave. It's almost concussive. It's amazing. It's pretty, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely an experience. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, you know, just the, the, all the energy that's being thrown around. And hopefully it's, it's a loving, beautiful energy. There's not a lot of nuttiness going on. And yeah, there's really nothing like it. The other thing that you and I talked about when we talked last was you said you had just finished working on some music with some friends. Oh. You, you didn't give me any details. Was it Trip the Witch you were talking about? Yeah, yeah, it must have been. So yeah. tell, tell me all about this. This was like what you were kind of keeping yourself occupied with. 
It, it was. Um, well, I, I made this record with the great Tom Bukovac. Now, Tom Bukovac will become a household name when I tell you uh, that your record collection probably has him on most of your records. He's been in Nashville for about 28 years and has played on thousands of records. And in my humble opinion, I think he's one of the finest guitar players on the planet. And um, he's just a, a lovely, lovely guy. I love him to death. And we, um, we were introduced uh, via email and we spoke on the phone and we started making this record. We still haven't met. We have not met nose to nose. Everything's Wait, been over the phone. You made a record with a guy you never met before? We haven't met nose to nose. We, we got on the phone and we spoke for about three hours and it was as, it was as if we, we've known each other for a hundred years. And we talked and talked and talked and we finally said, let's make, let's make a record. We made this record and we made the record entirely sending videos back to one, of, one another. Um, check out this part I have or Tom would have an entire song written or I would have an entire song or we would take a part that he had and a part that I had and, and make a song out of them. So yeah, we made an entire record virtually basically. That is crazy. And he's another example. This comes up on the show all the time about how much rock music is getting made in Nashville. Yeah. Like it's not just well, a country town anymore. There's so many rock bands that are working on music and recording there. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, Nashville, as it's always been, just, you know, just this hotbed, you know, did you, did you by chance watch that, that Ken Burns documentary? It's like, uh, like an eight part series on country music kind of goes through all the Nashville days from the fifties and sixties. I don't know if I saw that one, but I literally just watched the one about the Nashville songwriters called it all starts with a song. Okay. And that was really interesting because it wasn't about the musicians or anything. It was just centered around the songwriting community, especially the songwriters that are the behind the scenes songwriters that aren't the right. actual artists that record the music. And some artists can, can write songs like that. A lot of the musicians I talk to can't that they like just to kind of sit down with strangers and try to write a song and then do it for somebody else. Is that something that you can do? Cause you were writing trip the witch stuff for, like this was for a band that you guys were going to do. You weren't writing it for other people, right? Um, no, this was solely for this project and yeah. this record. Um, but yeah, if I, I could um, definitely sit down with somebody and write a song. Yeah, I, I definitely could. It's, it's, um, it's one of the, the beauties within that, that songwriting community. And, you know, it, it can even be done virtually. You know, we don't even need to be in the same room anymore. Uh, like, I mean, look, look at this right now. It's just pretty cool. Like we can sit here. I can grab a guitar and be like, okay, I have a great part here. What do you got for me, Carrie? Yeah. And I would be like, let me go get my clarinet, Dean. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be playing, I'll be rocking out some serious green sleeves and that'll be about it. That's a good one. I like it. Green sleeves. Ooh, that's a good one. That was what I remember from like the marching bands. Like, let's go band. Like, I'm so envious of those cool marching bands you see in the big giant universities that take the field and they make these geometric patterns and they're in the shape of Michael Jackson moonwalking. I'm like, how do they do that and play? I had a hard enough time just trying to play. So years ago, we were on on the road, this is years ago, uh, we were on the road and I think we were in Ohio. I think it was the Ohio State Band. I'm talking many, many years ago, just after number four came out. And um, someone approached me from the band for Ohio State and they gave me a VHS, a VHS. And they said, hey, man, we want you to have that. We do Sour Girl and Heaven and Hot Rods. No way. Yes, I have the VHS somewhere. But they were out on the field doing all this stuff, playing Sour Girl, and then they go into Heaven and Hot Rods. I was like, wow, far out, man. That is cool. Yeah. Um, I know I got to let you go in a minute, but today is the, uh, the, today, this is why I love October. 
It starts with my birthday and ends with my favorite day of the year, Halloween. I talked to John Five not too long ago, who's a prolific guitar player in his own right. Yes. He told me the story about how when he was a kid, his mom needed a last minute costume to send him to school in because he needed to compete in a Halloween costume contest in elementary school. And so John Five's mom dressed him up as a high class call girl. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. And he went to school and he won the costume contest. Oh my gosh. That is a great story. So I need to know when you and your brother were kids, what were some of the most memorable Halloween costumes? Because I need to know if this is a common thing that famous guitar players got dressed up like a hookers when they were kids. <laughs> okay, I have to tell you something. This is really amazing. So, and this was completely put together by Robert. And I'm trying to think he was probably, my goodness, he was probably... I was about 12. So he must have been about seven or eight years old. This was no help from mom. This was completely Robert's vision. So Robert was a bigger kid. So he kind of kind of fit into some of the stuff I was wearing. I was a really little kid, small. And Robert was always, you know, uh, uh, taller. And so Robert took one of, this is going back to this, you know, very early 70s. Robert had, I think, seen the movie Born Losers, okay, with uh, Billy Jack, right? You with me on this? Oh, I'm with you. Motorcycle gangs. Robert wanted to be a motorcycle gang guy, so he had on a leather coat, had my mom's wig with a bandana, and, like, had jeans on with, like, my motorcycle boots tucked in. I mean, here's, like, a seven-year-old kid, like, emulating he's in a motorcycle gang. (laughs) And uh, yeah, it was it was pretty amazing. It was, you'll have to ask Robert about that. It yeah. was a pretty amazing costume. And I was wearing that year, I was wearing, my sister had just taken a trip to Europe. She was in school still. And she came back from Spain with this huge sombrero. <laughs> and I, I was wearing uh, this sombrero with, um, my brother-in-law was, did some, time in the service so he had all these kind of cool like bomb shells and these like you know machine gun empty shells so i had like these bullets going across the, the bandoliers bandana. you look like I was like, I was like a, i was like a bandito you know <laughs> so i you know i don't know i, I was a bandito and Ro- robert was like a motorcycle gang guy that no hint at all that you guys would end up in a rock band not at all but the high class call girl is spectacular. I don't know if you know John Five, but literally, I was doubled over crying when he was telling no, me that story. That is so brilliant. And when, next time I see him, I'm that's my segue. <laughs> that is going to be my segue. He's going to be like, "Damn it, Mistress Carrie, why did you tell him that?" No, no, we're going to demand some photos. Oh, so he said he's got them. He told me he has photos. I'm sure he does. <laughs> So this this is this will be my mission. I'm sure I'll run into John at some point soon, right? Yep. When I do, we'll exchange numbers, and I'm going to say, "Come on, man, please send me those high class curl call girl photos, and I'll get them to you." Yes, <laughs> that would be amazing. That would be amazing. Okay. Well, if you get them before November fifth, when I see you at the Palladium, that would be awesome. But otherwise. I will see you not too long from now. I can't wait to see you guys on the road. It's so nice to be able to actually go to concerts. I know. I know. Be great to see you. Yeah, you too. Stay safe and healthy before then so the tour doesn't get disrupted. And we will see you guys at the Palladium on November 5th. Sounds great. Thanks for making my birthday today. Happy birthday. Thank you. I'll see you later. Bye, Carrie. There he is, the one and only Dean DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots. STP is hitting the road, and like I said, you can see him November 5th at the Palladium in Worcester. Tickets are available now. You can get the details not only on that date, but on Stone Temple Pilots. Find all of their links for their socials, their website, everything in the show notes of this podcast. 
You'll also find the corresponding playlist linked in the show notes, which is filled with all of the music and artists that we talked about in this interview. Special thanks to my sponsor, Digital Federal Credit Union at dcu.org. And if you liked what you heard, don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss anything from the Mistress Carrie podcast. New episodes come out every Wednesday, plus every weekday you get the sit rep. The Situation Report is all your rock news, music headlines, and industry info in less than five minutes. Plus, you never know when there's going to be a bonus episode like Dean DeLeo from Stone Temple Pilots calling on your birthday. You can join me live every Tuesday night at 8.30 on my Facebook page for my video show called Cocktails in the War Room. And for details on that, for everything else, and to shop in the official online Mistress Carrie store, just log on to MistressCarrie.com. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. 92% of households that start the year with Peloton are still active a year later. 92% because of a bike? Not just bikes. We also make treadmills and rowers. Oh, let me guess, for elite athletes only, right? Nope. It doesn't matter if you're an avid exerciser or new to working out. Peloton can help you achieve your fitness goals. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton bikes, tread or row, risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. The Venture X card from Capital One gives you premium travel benefits. Perfect for seeing Taylor Swift The Eras Tour. Presented by Capital One. Oh, I do love her. Earn five times miles on flights and ten times miles on hotels through Capital One Travel. Enjoy your stay in Suite 13. Whoa, 13? That's Taylor's lucky number. The Venture X card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details.